Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, Pastor. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. We are here, we are here to worship. We have come here to worship. Um, I have some bad news many of you probably have heard already. Um, you remember Tracy and Russell Payne. Tracy sang um, one of the services for our revival. She sang a solo. Uh, she is the daughter of um, the pastor who baptized me, Brother Connie. Uh, and her husband, Russell, has been a free will Baptist pastor for a long time. Uh, their son, a young man uh, named Casey, uh, passed away uh, suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just um, a horribly tragic situation. So they're trying to get their feet under them, and um, they need God's grace. They need us to pray. Uh, reached out to them. I don't know anything about any arrangements or anything like that yet. I don't even know for sure what the cause of death was. Um, certainly natural causes. But anyway, it's just a, just a, a parent's worst nightmare. Uh, so pray for Russell and Tracy Payne and for the Payne family and for the Carriker family uh, as uh, they're grieving and going through this terrible, terrible uh, time uh, for, for them. So take them to the throne of grace, to the Lord, and we know that God's grace will be sufficient, but the truth is uh, things will never be the same. Things will never be the same. Uh, and it's not the kind of thing that you get over. <clears throat> you know, the Bible, uh, the Bible says that when the age to come comes, that he's going to wipe every tear away from our eyes. And that assumes that we will all have tears to wipe away. All of us. Uh, and... There are certain things that happen in our lives that changes life forever, and there is always a deep sadness. Um, there is a deeper joy, um, and of course they are already expressing that. There is a deeper joy. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I don't want you to grieve as those who have no hope. There's a, there's a hopeful grief. It is still grief. Uh, and... No one who knows anything about Jesus ever says anything as as foolish and callous as well. You know they're with the Lord. You know what's you remember? Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he wept. The Bible says Jesus wept. And death is an invader, and it's the last enemy to be defeated. And we know that is coming. Uh, but until then, Jesus said, "In this world, you will have trouble." Moses said in Psalm ninety that our days are, or years are 70 or 80 if we have the strength and yet their span is but sorrow and trouble. So, you know, we say, as we should, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Some, sometimes that's really hard to do. Sometimes that's really hard to do. So most of you in here can relate in some way. Uh, and maybe even as I've made that announcement, some old wounds from decades ago have, have been reopened. Uh, but God, God is good and God is gracious. God knows what it's like for his son to die. And today we're going to come to the Lord's table. And if you're a Christian, we invite you to come. We are going to come and receive these symbols of the blood of Jesus shed for us and the body of Jesus broken for us. Uh, he died for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. He not only died, but he rose again on the third day. He has defeated death, and he's coming back for us. The Bible says that when we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We know that he's coming back for us, and death is going to be defeated. Until that day, we're in between the times. We're in between the times, and we all feel it in our own bodies, the power of the Spirit, and also the, the weight of sin. And we are looking for that great... Redemption and Resurrection Day. In the meantime, don't forget our brothers and sisters. The Bible says to 
to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also to weep with those, with those who weep. So, remember their family. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and bow your heads, and we're going to pray together. <clears throat> Maybe there is a, a deep sadness and sorrow in your own heart this morning, in spite of the fact that you know that your sins are forgiven, that you know that Jesus is risen. Um, the Lord invites you to cast this care and this sadness upon Him. Uh, God knows what it's like to grieve. He grieves with us. He is never distant from us. Sometimes it feels like it, but he, He's never far away. Others this week have been diagnosed with cancer and have undergone surgeries and difficulties. Maybe your week has been wonderful. Maybe you have experienced great victory and success and you have a great testimony to share a word of praise because God has done something great in your life we're gathered here as brothers and sisters knowing one another and loving one another weeping together and rejoicing together and we're going to keep doing that until Jesus comes back for us Father, you've told us through your Son that the greatest commandment is to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we do love you. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you better. Help us to love you more. And your Son taught us to love our neighbor, all of our neighbors, the rich and the poor and the black and the white and the successful and the struggling those who are easy to love and those who are hard to love we pray that the love of your spirit the love of your son would be shed abroad in our hearts again or give us tender hearts give us hearts that care give us hearts that notice Give us hearts that are not selfish or concerned only with our own lives. Help us to love you better. I pray that you would help us as we gather around the table today to remember the great sacrifice, the great sacrifice of all sacrifices. When you sent your son who willingly laid down his life for our sins that we might be forgiven and have everlasting life. Help us to remember. Help us to remember what you've done and what you're doing and what you're going to do. We pray for Russell and Tracy and their family that you would give them your grace and your peace. Lord, this has come so suddenly. We pray that you'd wrap your arms around them and draw them close to you and give them a peace that surpasses understanding. And we pray that you would be with us in this service today. Help us to open our hearts to your word and your spirit. Help us to open our mouths and raise our voices and sing our prayers and our praises to you. We want you to be pleased because you are our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At the end of the service today, um, we have a special guest. It's not really a guest, it's one of us, but uh, <clears throat> she is going to give a presentation uh, tell us what's going on in, in her life. Uh, but when we end the service, we're going to uh, turn off Facebook Live. So those of you who are with us on Facebook won't get to hear this. But because of the nature of the mission, uh, we're not going to be able to broadcast that. But be prepared to give a generous offering at the end of service to send another one of our young people uh, overseas to do the Lord's work. All right, let's stand together and let's sing. Let's sing. Be grateful. Let's worship. You are holy. You 
family let's continue to sing together this is a new with me it's a beautiful song let's learn it
one more old hymn together.
chosen a fun title for the message today, The Ultimate Ingrate. <laughs> ingrate, of course, is someone who is ungrateful. I didn't know that for a long time. I would hear usually teenage boys being called ingrates. He's just an ingrate. Uh, but I didn't know what that was for a long time. Well, this text describes the ultimate ingrate, the worst kind of ungrateful person. Unspeakable blessings have come to this person, and they have despised them. It's the worst sin you can imagine in our text today. It's the worst sin you can imagine. Hebrews 5.11 through 6.12 Have you ever said, they should have been a lot better by now? Should have made a lot more progress by now. What's going on? In my first place of ministry, I was asked to help coach a fourth grade baseball team in Sulphur, Oklahoma. And I had big plans for these young men. I was going to teach them all these wonderful things that I had learned growing up playing baseball. One game, we were on defense. They hit the ball to right field, to Timothy, who was in right field. And he sort of pounced on, ambushed the ball. And when he finally found the handle of the ball, he straightened up and slung it to center field. That's never the right play. It's never a good idea, but that's where he threw the ball. I don't know what he was thinking. Obviously, he wasn't. One day, I looked out on the field during the game, saw a boy. Actually, it was the same boy, Timothy. His baseball pants were being held up by a black cowboy belt and a great big rodeo belt buckle that was flashing in the sunshine in his baseball uniform. That, that was uh, the team... That was the team we had that year. We lost every game except the one game that would have ended the season, the one game we were all praying to God that we would lose so we could all come home and get on with our lives and escape this unceasing shame and embarrassment. Somehow, the boys eked out a win in that one game. And so we had to stay another couple of hours and endure the shame and misery uh, and then they lost that game. When I was in the fourth grade, we were turning double plays. We were picking people off at second base. We were throwing out the runner trying to steal second base. We were squeeze bunting. We were doing all kinds of things. And, and this, was, this was what I inherited. I had all these great expectations. The point is, by this age, they should have been far more advanced than they were. We got there the first day. They couldn't even play catch. They couldn't even play catch. When I was playing, if you were playing catch in the fourth grade and you dropped the ball, you had to run a lap. That's how careful you had to be when you were playing catch. These guys couldn't catch the ball. And so all of my plans went out, out the window. I was watching the NCAA National Wrestling Tournament the other day. Some of you may have watched it. This is a couple of weeks ago. And my good friend that I've known pretty much all my life, I saw on TV, he was officiating the wrestling match, the National Championship Wrestling Tournament on television. We used to call high school wrestling events together. You remember when I was a wrestling official years ago? Before I went back, before I went back to school, I did that. I quit to go back to school. And we used to call together, and now there he was on ESPN calling this wrestling tournament. Over the years, he has really had to work hard to work up the ranks in junior high, high school, college, Division II, all the way up to Division I. And he's worked so hard. And so I called him a couple of days after the tournament was finished just to congratulate him on this great achievement that, uh, that he had made and that he had done. Um, and I asked him how some of the other guys were doing that we used to call with, some of the other guys that I called tournaments with and duels with, quads, whatever. And he said that many of them aren't any better than they were 10 years ago. Okay, I want you to think about that. He said they haven't improved in... Over a decade, and in fact, he said some of them are worse because they know that there are so few wrestling officials, we don't have to work hard, we don't have to try to get any better because they don't have anybody to replace us. And so, actually, over these years, they have gotten worse 
and not better. No improvement, no improvement. Maybe even gone backwards. There's a presumption in life that people will improve over time. It's not an unreasonable expectation that we should improve the further we go. It's natural. Have you ever said they should have been much better by now? Something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. Well, that's what's going on in this passage, and it's a warning to us today. It's a warning to us today. Those who have claimed to be Christians for a long, long time. In our passage, the pastor says something has gone wrong. He says you've stopped growing in your faith. You've become dull of hearing. You don't hear the word of God as you should. And in fact, you're declining. You're going backwards. And he says you're in real danger. The, past, the truth, the warning in this passage is a real danger. Not just a hypothetical. It is a real danger and it is a warning to all of us. It is a warning to all of us. I imagine when he gets to the message, the end of chapter 5 verse 10, I imagine there's a long pregnant pastoral pause. Sometimes in order to get people's attention, you have to, there's nothing like silence. To get people's attention. And I, I can imagine that there's a pause here. And he looks at them with, with loving eyes. But with concerned eyes. And said you better listen up. Because many of you are in trouble. This is a good place to pause. For you to ask yourself this morning. Am I growing up in the faith? Am I going deeper and deeper in prayer and in Bible study? Or have I become content? Stagnant? Have I stalled out in my Christian faith? What about hearing the preaching? Does the preaching of the Word of God affect me the way that it used to? Or do the words sort of bounce off my heart and do no good? Am I growing? Am I stagnant? Am I going backwards? This is a warning to the people of God. And it's so relevant today as it ever has been. The, f- the first thing he talks about is the problem in verses 11 through 14. And he says to them that it's shameful. He, this is a shame and honor culture. He says it is shameful to slide back in slackness. So he confronts them with the problem of their spiritual lives. He says there's a problem in your spiritual lives. You've become immature babies. You've become babies when by now you should have been grown-ups. About this, he says, we have much to say which is hard to explain. Why is it hard to explain? Since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of God's word. You have gone back to needing milk. Notice the imagery of they've slidden back. Not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Hearing the word and knowing how to read the word and being skilled in the word, how to interpret it, how to understand it. You, The one who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, being still a baby. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their faculties trained. The, most translations say by practice, but it really just means by continuing, by constancy, to distinguish good from evil. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their faculties trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. There's there's a lot at stake there, distinguishing, knowing good from evil. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to open your word again. I pray that you'd give us listening hearts, soft hearts, and tender hearts. pray that these words would sink down deeply into our hearts and take root and bear much fruit, that we would not have hard hearts of stone like that path where the seed could not penetrate and the birds of the air took it away, gone away. But Lord, give us us hearts that that are good soil for your word, that they would go down deep and change us and transform us, make us not only love you more, which is the greatest thing, but to make us more useful in building your kingdom and bringing glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. So the pastor has been preaching on a deep subject. If you read Hebrews, you know this is deep stuff. This is deep stuff. He's been talking about the heavenly high priesthood of Jesus, what Jesus has accomplished and what he's doing now as he is at God's right hand. But he stops here and suddenly and directly addresses the people. So I'm talking about that, but now I'm going to talk straight to you. And this problem, until he has addresses it, addressed it, he can't go on until, until he addresses them very directly. They have, been, they have become dull of hearing the word of God. You'll no, notice here how many times he says word. And it's actually the word logos is there more times than it's translated word in our Bibles. Several times. The word of righteousness, the word of Christ, the word of God. Uh, and even in the very first sentence, he uses the word, word, logos. So it's about the word. You become dull of hearing the word. Well, the New Testament teaches us about being born again. And it says that when the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, listen to me, church, there's an expectation of transformation that doesn't end until Jesus comes back. It is an ongoing thing. And if there's not, it says that there's been a malfunction. If you're not being transform from one degree of glory to the next into the image of Jesus, something has gone wrong in your Christian life. And some of these Christians have stalled in their spiritual growth and have actually slidden back into what he describes as childlike immaturity. And the problem has to do with their ability to understand and hear the word of God. In chapter 4 verse 12, he uses this powerful image and says, the word of God is living and what? Active, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now contrast that with this. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, but you have become dull of hearing. It is sharp. You have become dull of hearing. Slack in hearing the living and active Word of God. And what he's going to say to them is, if this continues, it's going to end in your spiritual death. Death, darkness, separation from God. So he basically calls them slackers. Who wants their pastor to stand up on Sunday morning and call you a bunch of slackers? But that's really kind of what he's doing. We have a gym down here called Slackers. And I assume that the strategy is when you drive by it, it's kind of insulting you so that you'll see there's something wrong with you. And I need to get in there and get to work. I don't want to be a slacker. That's kind of what he's doing here. He's saying a lot, many of you folks are being slackers and you've, you've, you're backsliding. And so the pastor confronts us. We don't like to be confronted, but sometimes if there's going to be transformation, there has to be confrontation. If there's going to be transformation, there has to be confrontation. Has that ever happened in your life? He says, there is a million miles between where you ought to be by now. Notice he says, according to the time. Where you ought to be now and where you actually are. Why are you still way back here? What have you been doing? Many of us have walked into our children's rooms before and they've been working on their homework for five hours and they're on problem number two. What have you been doing all this time? That's, that's kind of the idea here. When I was 15 years old, at the end of the season, that's interesting because my dad had been telling me this throughout the season. I didn't believe it until someone else beside my dad told me that. You know, you parents have that. They come home and tell, and tell you, this, my teacher, my coach told me this. Wow, that is so right. And you say, I told you that a hundred times in the last month. Well, R Rodney, my coach, he said, Jeff, you just really didn't give it much effort this season. This is the end of the year. And I will never forget that moment. Sometimes it takes a moment of confrontation, especially, especially when you weren't expecting it. And we don't forget it and it can change the course of our lives. Sometimes confrontation is necessary. He says they should be ashamed. It's kind of what he was doing to me. He was sort of shaming me. Shame can be a useful thing. Some people say, well, we should never have, we should never have any shame. Well, sometimes it's important for us to be ashamed, and we ought to be ashamed. It motivates us to do better things. He says they should be ashamed to be babies. You're a bunch of babies, he says. I'm not calling you that. I'm just telling you that's what he was saying to them. You're a bunch of babies. Sucking on your bottle still, when you should be eating the meat of the Word of God. So a hunger for the Word of God is as natural 
for a spiritually living being as a hunger for food is for a physically living being. If, if someone never gets hungry, something has gone wrong. As you grow, baby food won't satisfy you anymore. It's a shameful image. A, a grown man sucking on a baby bottle. I mean, that's a shameful image, and that's the kind of thing he's saying to them here. And that's the effect of his words. And again, the problem had to do with the word. Their backsliding condition had to do with their word. And their transformation depends on hearing the word of God again, as they should, as God has <clears throat> given them the ability to do. Uh, Jonathan Griffiths, one scholar, translates it like this. He, he thinks that the force of his words, you become dull of hearing, is this. You have become unresponsive to sermons. This is a sermon that is being delivered to them. And he, say, he is saying, you can sit there week after week after week after week unmoved. Like Lot's wife, a pillar of salt, unmoved by hearing the word of God week after week after week. He says, if that's happening, something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. He says, you should by now, in fact, be teachers. Some of you, however, need someone to teach you. Some translations, it's uh, the first principles or the ABCs. This is the way it would have been used in that culture. You need someone to teach you the ABCs of the Christian faith. When by now you should be the one up there teaching. The first principles, he says. And then he says, you are unskilled in the word of righteousness. I think those are, those are similar things. The first principles. You say, what are some of these first principles? Do you remember when the Ethiopian eunuch was on his way on the road to Gaza back home and God's Spirit sent Philip to him? And Philip comes up beside him and this man is not a Christian, yet he doesn't understand what the Word of God means. And Philip gets up in his chariot and he teaches him from the Word of God. This is talking about Jesus. It is a first principle. It is a foundational thing that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The sacrifice for our sins. We learned that in Sunday school. It is a first principle. It's the first thing that the Ethiopian learned about Jesus, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He says, but I want to plow deep into the Word of God and show you from the Bible how Jesus is our eternal high priest who has ascended to God's hand, who is our advocate with the Father. He says, I want to go deeper in advanced teaching, but, but I can't yet because you're not ready for it. So I think that he's talking about our ability as Christians to read the whole Bible he would have been talking about the Old Testament, but read the whole Bible according to Jesus to see how Jesus fulfills the entire scripture and to see all of it in light of who Jesus is. And he says, you, you just don't have the ability to do that, even though you should by now. Move beyond the ABCs. What I have found as I've been studying the word of God now for several decades is the deeper you dig, the more you find. We should never be content. Well, I know enough. I've been in Sunday school all my life. I've been in church all my life. I don't need to dig any deeper. There is no bottom to this thing. Someone has described the Word of God, and especially the Gospel of John, it is like a river that is shallow enough for a child to play in, to splash in, and deep enough for an elephant to swim in. And that is the case. We should continue. Whoa, what just happened here? Did I just get louder? All right. Les likes that. So let me turn to you as your pastor and say, some of you by now ought to be able to teach. By now, in your walk of faith, you ought to know the Word of God so well that you would have no problem teaching someone else. This is what the, the Word of God has to say about the Lord Jesus Christ and about sanctification, and about justification, and about last things. You ought to know by now. How long have you been a Christian, he says? You've been a Christian for five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, and you're further back than you were when you started? You haven't been diligent to study hard enough and give the attention you should have to the Word of God. There are people sitting in all of our churches just like that by now. You should be teaching. He says you should be teaching one another. 
In chapter 10, he says that you should, when you come together, encourage one another. Colossians and Ephesians says that we should be teaching one another. The teaching ministry of the church is not just for the pastor. All of your, the information and education and transformational teaching should not come just from the pastor. We are teaching one another. We just came from Sunday school. And everybody ought to go to... Everybody ought to go. You should be hungry for the Word of God. I am going to take every opportunity I have to sit and listen and talk about the Word of God and understand the Word of God. I am not going to miss an opportunity. We should have a hunger for it. Don't be satisfied with the ABCs. Can you imagine a kindergartner coming home after the second week and announcing, I've learned all that I need to know. Got the ABCs down. If he does, he doesn't even understand the purpose of the ABCs. They're not ending themselves. This so that you can learn to read and to learn to write and to learn to think. They're for a higher purpose. Why do me, so many people fall away? Fall away, fall away. Well, they're content with just, with just the foundation. And you're content with just the foundation. I have no interest in going any further. He says you're, you're in danger of falling away. People come to church so often for a sugar high instead of for spiritual depth. For a sugar high. If I go away with a nice tingling feeling, I know that I've had church. Well, I, I'm all for emotion. I'm all for being excited. I'm all for e all the range of emotion. God has made us emotional beings. But if the reason we come to church is to get a spiritual sugar high, then we're in trouble. A sugar high won't get you through Sunday. It may, be not, it may not last you through lunch. <laughs> okay? You may leave from here and go be a total jerk to your waitress at lunch. God forbid. God help us. Deeper roots will hold you firm no matter how strong the storms of life. We need spiritual depth. A little later in this chapter, he says, we have this anchor for the soul. Here he's talking about, you may blow away with the, with the wind, like dust in the wind. He also talks about the problem of discernment. I pointed that out to you just a second ago. He says that the mature, those who have teeth to eat meat, to digest it, it is only they who have the ability to discern. He's talking about growing in wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to discern good from evil. That's why in Proverbs he says, Listen, my son, to your father's teaching. Do not despise your mother's instruction. Otherwise, you're going to be led astray. Wisdom is about growing up and becoming mature in our faith. Being able to discern good from evil. I want you to just stop and think about that in our culture right now. Even people in the church who are buying all kinds of deception and lies and absolutely insane, ridiculous ideas. And they're saying, yeah, I think I'm for that now. The mature and wise know the difference between good and evil and can discern good from evil. Why do so many people fall for such nonsense in the world? They don't truly know the Word of God. As it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. As it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Distinguishing good from evil, a part of this is knowing false teaching. It has to do with the false ideas floating around in our culture, but also false teaching in that can creep into the church. Paul in Acts 20 talks about in Ephesus that ravenous wolves will arise from within the church to devour the church. He says you have to watch out. And so in chapter 13 verse 9 he says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not eating ceremonial foods which have no benefit. So he has a particular application there. Distinguishing good from evil. How do we do that? The Word of God is the plumb line. It is the measuring stick. We know good from evil and we can discern good from evil that comes to us from our culture when we are grounded deeply in the Word of God. Have you moved on to maturity? Or have you stalled out in your spiritual journey. When you get a foundation, you're a long ways from being finished. We're talking right now about the possibility, we don't know for sure the possibility of building a new sanctuary. 
You may be excited, you may be scared to death to hear that. I don't know, but we are discerning God's will for our church. Usually, the week after Easter is the worst attendance of the whole year. Well, there's not a whole lot of room here today. But there are a few places here and there. If God wants us to step out in faith, rise up and build, we want to do that. We want to do that. But the point is, what if we built a foundation and then had a big celebration and said, man, that was great. Wasn't that a wonderful project? That's a beautiful foundation that we have there. When you're born, you're supposed to grow up. You build a foundation, you're supposed to build upon it. A building is supposed to go up. God excoriated, chastised His people because they laid the foundation for the temple after it had been torn down and they let it lay there for years and years and years and years. And He sent prophets to them and said, What do you think you're doing? Are you happy with the foundation? Buildings go up. And living things grow up, grow up like a tree planted by the streams of water. Its branches grow out further and higher. So that's the point of chapter 6 now, verses 1 through 3. Okay? He says, let us move on. So not just the problem, but the proposal. He says, it's good to move on to maturity. It, this is a good thing. This is what you should be doing. He's talked about the problem, now he talks about the proposal. He says they can grow up, and he encourages them to move beyond the ABCs of the faith. Move on to maturity. You don't have to stay where you are. Notice the text here. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God with instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, to some of us, that may sound like, wow, that's really deep stuff. But he's saying this is just a foundation. Resurrection, eternal judgment, baptism, repentance from dead works, faith toward God. And this we will do, move, move on to maturity, if God permits. He says, we can't do this on our own. You can't do anything on your own. It takes God's grace. If you're going to move on, it's going to take God's grace, God working in your life. Does anybody here know what our first core value is in our church? It's on a sign right out there in the lobby. We will grow up and we will grow deep. Anybody, you guys didn't know that was our first core value? You remember it now. It's that image of a tree planted by the streams of water, deep, deep roots. It has taken root, and therefore it has grown tall and wide, and it, is, and it has borne much fruit. That, that is what we're trying to do here, okay? To grow up and to grow deep. And we can move on to maturity. That can be your life. Deeply grounded in the Word of God, not being blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine, chasing things around here and there. Well, I hear this on TikTok. I see this on Facebook. I heard this on the news. And chasing this over here and chasing this over there. We know people who do that. They're constantly chasing the next new big idea. Paul talks about in Acts chapter 17 that on the Areopagus, it, Luke describes them, they only sat around all the time and talked about the latest new idea. You will never grow up and you'll never grow deep if, you're, if you don't become grounded in the Word of God and stop chasing all this stuff around all the time. All of these things that he lists here are the first things, the ABCs of the faith. That's all I'm going to say about that. He says we can move on. I want to spend the rest of our time on the peril in verses 4 through 6. For the ultimate ingrate, the one who's received the blessing of God in Christ Jesus and His Spirit, the gift of salvation, for someone like that has received this, instead of being grateful, he turns away from Christ. He says, for that kind of person, repentance is impossible. It's impossible. Listen to what he says. He says, if they refuse to grow up and move on, they are in eternal danger. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once, underline that word, once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they then commit apostasy, if they fall away, it is impossible for them to be renewed under repentance. 
Why? Since they are crucifying the Son of God on their own account and holding Him up to contempt. Let me just take a step back before I explain it in more detail. He's saying, if you are a Christian who has received salvation as a gift, received the Spirit of God, and if by neglect you, you go back and back and back and back until you come to a place in your life where you renounce your faith in Christ, I no longer believe, I don't need any of that anymore, you turn away from Christ, you are lost forever. There is no chance that you can come back. Now that, is, that, is a, that is a frightening thought, isn't it? That is a frightening thought. Let me just give you a pastoral word right here. If you are worried that you have done that, you have not done that. Okay, here's why. Because if you become an apostate, your heart will be so hard and so cold, you won't care a thing at all. In fact, in fact you will hate the things of God. You will probably spend your life trying to tear down the kingdom of God. But he says, it's possible. It's possible if you don't take care. If you don't take care, if you don't move on. Some people say, I just want to slide in. I just want to coast in. The hard work's behind me in my Christian life. He's saying, if your idea is, I just want to coast in, he says, you may not make it in at all because it's dangerous to neglect your relationship with God. There's a danger here. In fact, this danger is the reason for the book. It's the reason for the book of Hebrews. To point them again and again to Jesus and say, keep your eyes on Him. Continue to follow in His footsteps. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't stop becoming deeper and deeper in the Word of God. If you do that, you may, be, you may begin to slide back and you may be lost. He says, once been enlightened. All through the book of Hebrews, this word, once, comes up. Jesus sacrificed once and for all. Once been enlightened. This enlightening, being brought out of the darkness into light, happens one time and one time only. You're born again, out of the darkness into light, adopted into God's family when you were a slave of sin. Once been enlightened. And notice that word impossible. He says it is impossible for them to be renewed to repentance. Impossible to be renewed to repentance. He says it's impossible for them to be forgiven. If they have in baptism claimed the name of Christ, stood before the world and said, Jesus is my Savior, and then come to a place, a hardened heart, and say, I don't believe that stuff anymore. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Jesus. Maybe he was a nice guy, whatever. I don't believe it anymore. Harden your heart. He said it's impossible to be renewed unto repentance because you have exposed him to public shame and disgrace having received the gift of God that has come to us at such a high price of the very blood and body of Jesus, to say, I don't believe it anymore. I don't want anything to do with it. The church is a bunch of hypocrites. The Word of God is not true. I have no interest in it. Crucifying Jesus again. We become as one of those who cried out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! He said, if you do that, if you come to that place, the Holy Spirit is done with you. You're lost forever. Now, I know the time. I have a lot more to say. A lot more to say about that. I believe that the description of these people in verses 4 through 6, it's a description of true Christians. In chapter 10, he says, he uses this exact same word. He says, remember when you were first enlightened. He's talking about Christians. You have been enlightened. He's not just talking about someone who has just dabbled in the Christian faith, been around the church. He says you have tasted the Word of God. That word is used in chapter 2 for Jesus tasting death for everyone. I want you to listen to me for just a second. Some people will say it just means they just tasted it, they didn't swallow it. Did Jesus truly experience death in its fullness or not? Jesus tasted death for everyone. This tasting in verses 4 through 6 is a complete experience. This receiving the Spirit of God, the powers of the age to come. Now, he does not say, 
If you're a Christian and you commit a sin or even fall into sin, then you're lost. That is, it is not about that, although that is dangerous. He says, hardening your heart in sin is dangerous. It may result in backsliding to the point where you commit apostasy, and that is to turn your back on Jesus forever. It is not falling into sin, though that is dangerous. Listen, the Bible says that we are by nature children of wrath. And to become a Christian means you become adopted into the kingdom of God. You become a child of God. Adopted. An heir of the kingdom. Now imagine I adopt a child. I bring this child into my family. This child takes my name. This child is my legal heir. When my, this child that I've adopted commits a, uh, commits a sin, disobeys me, are they no longer my child? What if this child becomes a total, what word can I use in church? Ingrate. Ingrate. Now, my child because of total ingrate, does that mean they're no longer my child? No, in chapter 12 he says, the Lord's going to discipline you. If you're his children, he's going to discipline you. When you're disobedient, it doesn't mean you're no longer his child. In order for an adopted child no longer to be my child, that child has to make a definite decision to say, I'm divorcing my parents. I'm no longer to be called by their name. Now, there may be discipline, okay? In living a life of sin, he's saying it can lead, and it will lead to this, Apart from God's grace and apart from repentance, it's dangerous. But Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. God is not looking for an opportunity to let go of this. We're safe in his hands, okay? And that's how he ends this. I'm not, I don't have time to talk about the parable of the fields. He says there are two. There's a field, the rain falls upon it. The, rain, the field that receives the, the rain and bears good fruit will be blessed by God but the one that receives the same rain that bears no fruit, it's going to be cursed and burned. That's an, that's an image of these two different kinds of people. But I want you to know how he comes back around at the end with pastoral optimism. Coaches do this sometimes. You get your, ki- you get your young men down on the sidelines, down at, in the corner, left field, and you chew them out. And then at the end of this, you say, listen, guys, I know you're going to do better. This is what he does. Notice in verse 9, the optimism. He says, our future can be bright because God is so good. He says, though we speak thus, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. We don't believe that's going to happen to you. God is going to keep you. You're going to persevere to the end and you're going to be saved. Things that belong to salvation. God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love which you show for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness in realizing the full assurance of hope until the end. We want you to persevere. We know that you're going to, we believe you're going to persevere to the end. We want you to. So that you may not be sluggish. That word sluggish is the same word that's used in 511, becoming dull of hearing. He says, you become dull of hearing. He comes back around at the end, chapter 6, verse 12. He said, we don't want you to become dull of hearing. But imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And he's going to, in in chapter 7, verse 1, start back up telling them about Jesus' high priesthood as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, he believes that this pausing for a moment and getting their attention and this confrontation is going to result in transformation. He can move on with the sermon. And I'm your pastor, and I don't believe that's going to happen to a single one of you. But you need to know, if we're not careful, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. So let's all move on to maturity. I want you to bow your heads with me. We are going to come to the Lord's table. When we come to the Lord's table, we are saying again. I want you to know that you're saying again, I will not forget... I will not turn my back on the Jesus whose body was broken and his blood was shed so that all of the blessings of God have come to me out of darkness into light, receiving the Holy Spirit, the good word of God, the gospel. We will not forget and we will not turn back.
This blessing has come to us at the highest price. We will be faithful by God's grace. It is all by God's grace. We will be faithful to Him to the end. Mary is going to play softly for just a moment. I want you to prepare your hearts to come to the Lord's table. We're going to pray the prayer of confession in just a moment. And then we're going to come to the Lord's table. You are saying once again, beloved, when you come to this table, Jesus, Jesus, I love you, I believe. And though I may have had a bad week, I may have fallen down, I may have messed up, Lord Jesus, I'm looking to you for my salvation. I'm looking to you for my sanctification. I'm looking to you to continue to transform my life day after day into your image. I want to bring glory to your life. I want to serve you. Is that true of your life? Do you know for sure that you belong to Him? Is the joy of your life and the goal of your life, even though some days it's very, very difficult? Is the goal of your life to please Him, to bring glory to Him? Maybe even right now, can you pray a prayer asking Him to be at work in you? Help me to grow. Help me to have a hunger for your word. To understand the deep truths of the word of God as they point me again and again to the Lord Jesus. Can you pray that from your heart today? His grace is greater than our sin. His grace is greater than our sin. And to prepare yourself to come to the Lord's table. Prepare your heart to come to the Lord's table. Are there sins that you need to confess to the Lord right now to repent of? The Lord loves you. Jesus died for you. His sacrifice is so precious. May we cherish it all of our lives. So that someday we may gather around that great throne and give praise to the Lamb of God whose blood was shed who was slain that we might have eternal life. Is your heart prepared to come to the Lord's table? Turn your attention to the back of your bulletin and we're going to pray this prayer of confession together. This will just help us to focus on different areas of life where we may have fallen short. If you don't have one or one that's close to you to read off of, that's okay. You can just listen in a spirit of confession and repentance. Let's pray together, church. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Would the deacons come forward and prepare this precious emblem and symbol reminding us again of our precious Savior. As the deacons prepare, let your mind, let your heart go back to that first night when they gathered together. The next day, Jesus was going to suffer and die for them. But before He did, He left them. He left them this meal this ordinance to remember Him by again and again and again. And the Bible tells us that as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is My body. And He took a cup, and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Father in heaven, we pray that as we come today, you would be pleased with who we are becoming by your grace and by your love and by your mercy. We thank you for your son for the blood shed for the forgiveness of all of our sins, for his body broken for us that we might have eternal life. We pray that you would give us thanksgiving, help us to truly be grateful and hope and great joy as we come to this table. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rise and come to the Lord's table.
the joy in my heart seeing you come back to church again, coming to the Lord's table again. Lord Jesus, they have not forgotten. They're here again because we love you and we believe. Paul's writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember together the body of our Lord broken for us. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us together remember the blood of our Lord Jesus shed for us all for the remission of all of our sins. Amen. What a blessing to know that our sins are forgiven. Would you be seated? Marion, are you prepared to play Amazing Grace? We're going to sing a verse, just a verse of Amazing Grace together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Facebook Live people, we're glad that you're with us today. God bless you. We'll give them a time.